Welcome to Google Cloud Next, and welcome to this session. Before we start the session, um, I just wanted to give a quick reminder that the feedback session will open in 20 minutes in every session. So we really, really appreciate your feedback, um, and we use it to improve our sessions in future. My name is Gagan Arora. I'm a product manager in Google Cloud. And today, I'm joined by my <coughs> colleague, Ravi, who is also a product manager. And a very special guest, Sam, Simon Langley, who is a Chief Information Security Officer at Morrison's. The agenda today for us is quite simple. Um, so Ravi and I are going to walk you through what cloud identity is and how it helps you to unify your users, devices, and applications all in one place. Um, we are also going to walk you through three key pillars of cloud identity. Security, simplicity, and flexibility. Then Simon has gra graciously agreed to come on stage and share his journey on how Morrison's is using cloud identity in their organization today. So before we get into what cloud identity is, how many people are actually familiar with Google Cloud Identity? Quite a few, actually, so that's good. Um, so I'll walk through it pretty quickly. Um, I want to leave a lot of time for Simon to share his tips around how they are deploying cloud identity. Um, before we start into cloud identity, I think it's good to understand why cloud identity is useful. Um, and in order to do that, we're going to walk you through some of the trends that we see in the industry today. So the workplace today is changing quite rapidly. And many of you are on the front line of it, seeing these changes day in and day out. The users today are no longer working from their corporate boundary. They're working from Starbucks, from airports, and even from this convention center. Also, the users are no longer confined to the employees that you have in your organization. But more often than not, your data and applications are being accessed by your partners, your contractors, and even in some cases, your customers. The next trend that we see in the industry is around the devices. So employees no longer just use the corporate devices that you hand out to them, but they often bring in their own devices as well. And those devices could be managed by your organization, or it could be completely unmanaged. And the last thing that we notice is, the application that used to stay in your data center in the past is now all over the place, with employees accessing SaaS applications to do their work, and also applications that are in your public and private cloud. The tools that we use today to manage a lot of these modern transformation are still pretty outdated. In most cases, we still tend to use VPN access. Um, and all these tools were designed for on-prem environment, and we are still stuck with using them for the modern transformation uh, workforce. So in 2011, about eight years ago, Google started this internal initiative called Beyond Corp Security Model, where we wanted all Googlers to be able to access their data and services from wherever they are, even from an untrusted network. This shifted the control, access control from the network perimeter to the perimeter around the user, the device, and the context around them. And this really transforms us into the real edgeless world where you're no longer trying to secure your network perimeter to secure access to your data and applications. Cloud identity is based on the foundation of beyond core security model that Google pioneered. Um, and it helps unify your users, devices, and application all in one place. It enables and accelerates the cloud-centric applications, but it also helps you with uh, meet you where you are with your on-prem IAM and uh, IAM systems and applications. So you may ask, what is cloud identity? Actually, it is inbuilt into your G Suite. So if you are using G Suite Basic, Business, or Enterprise, 
most of the G Suite free features are already built into your uh, cloud identity free features are built into your G Suite. It is also available for GCP. Uh, the cloud identity premium features are actually part of your G Suite enterprise licenses, but you can also add on cloud identity premium to your G Suite basic or your business queues that you may have. So let's quickly talk through the three core pillars that I mentioned for cloud identity. Cloud identity helps you secure your data and applications, your users and devices, um, by providing you tools like single sign-on, MFA, context for access, and so on and so forth, that enables you to deploy beyond Corp security model in your organization. It also helps simplify your IT and end user experience. And we know you have a lot of investment in your traditional systems, so we want to meet you where you are um, and then plug in with your on-prem systems as well. So I'll talk you through the Google um, Great Security, and then Ravi is going to come on board and talk about the later chip. A good security is one where it actually prevents the attacks from happening before they actually happen. And the good thing with Google is, because of our scale and the number of access that we see across our number of applications with billion plus users, we're able to see a lot of these signals um, that hackers are trying to use um, and use that to do machine learning to protect all the Google users. In fact, even if a hacker knows your username and password, 99.9% .9 of the time, Google is able to prevent that account takeover from happening in the first place. We prevent over 100 million attacks, takeover attempts in a, in a single day. A million of these in a single day. If you want, so this protection is available baseline for all Google users, but we also provide a wide range of second factor authentication that you can deploy in your organization starting from SMS and voice, which is fairly convenient, but also has fairly low level of assurance. And then all the way to the FIDO security keys, which has the highest level of assurance, is based on cryptography that helps you make sure that the application or website you're accessing is the actual website. Google recommends that your organization you should always deploy security keys as a second factor authentication, because that is the only known non-phishing resistant second factor uh, to be used. Rest all of them, if you, if you see on the screen, they're all pretty much fishable. But it's better than having no second factor at all. Now we understand that sometimes it's harder to roll out security keys to the entire workforce that you may have, and for your contractors and partners. Um, so we have tried to make it simpler by enabling Android phone as a security key. This allows you to have Android version 7 or higher, um, and you can enroll that phone as a security key instead of the physical security key. So it gives you the security of the, of the security key with the convenience of the mobile phone. There are no hardware to be used. There is no apps that you need to install. All you have to do is to enroll your phone as a security key, and you're good to go. If you want additional level of assurance that Google provides, uh, Pixel 3 has an embedded um, Titan M hardware chip that is manufactured by Google. It has Google firmware on it, um, and you can use Pixel 3. But as I said, you could use most of the Android phones with version 7 or higher as your security key now. We have done some recent enhancement on the second factor. So some of you may be using some other identity provider besides Google. And if you're using third-party identity provider, Google makes it easy for you to apply Google second factor controls after the SAML assertion. So this is extremely useful for organizations that have a standalone second factor solution that they have deployed, and most of their secure data resides in Google uh, apps. Now you can actually use Google second factor on top of your third party identity provider, um, if you like. We 
also introduced a new feature, which is one of the most asked features that we have. Um, and it is the session control then that admin can configure for your GCP tools. Um, so now, because there's a lot of sensitive data and, and production system running on GCP, you can configure how long an admin is able to use that session um, and configure it yourself. And finally, in order to secure your highest risk users, in addition to giving you all the tools with second factor, we introduced a program called Advanced Protection Program. And what this does is, once you enroll your highest risk users into this program, they will automatically get the most secure um, features that Google recommend, meaning they must use security keys. All their apps must be uh, whitelisted by your admins to prevent any malware from getting onto their devices. Um, and any new features that we think are important for your highest risk users will automatically get enabled with Advanced Protection Program. So we talked quite a bit about establishing user trust, knowing who the user is, um, and then making sure that they are who they say they are. But if you look at BeyondCorp holistically, there are other components to BeyondCorp. And that is essentially, instead of relying on your network perimeter, now you are allowing access based on what you know about the user, what you know about the device, and what you know about the context that they are in. And we have built this as a platform feature. So once you define what your company security posture is, you can easily apply that security posture to different endpoints, be it G Suite, be it GCP APIs, be it applications behind your identity by proxy. And those applications may reside on GCP, even other clouds or your on-prem applications. So let's look at a quick demo on how you would configure context-aware access that enables beyond Corp in your organization. So context-aware access has been in beta for a few months. And we recently went GA with it about two weeks ago. So if you haven't enabled it, please go enable it. And I'll show you exact steps that you can use to actually enable this in your organization. One of the most common use cases that we have seen on how people are actually using context-aware access today is I want to, I have a lot of sensitive data in my drive and docs, and I want to make sure that people accessing that data are coming from a secure device or from a secure location um, based on my company requirements. So in this demo, uh, I'm going to walk you through, let's say you have an analyst group in your organization, and because of some company policies, your compliance or regulation, you want those analysts to access your drive and docs only if they are in Germany. So let's see how you will set that up in your familiar admin console. So in your admin console now, you have a security. Uh, as you go to the security, you will see a new card called Contextware Access. And when you go inside, you will see three things. One is access levels. This is when you define your security posture of your company based on I need this type of device security, I need you to be coming from this geolocation or this IP address. Next, you assign those access levels to a set of users and a set of applications. And finally, you configure an end user message that they will see if they get denied because of the policy that you have implemented for them. So this is where we create a new access level where access is only allowed from, say, Germany. And as you could see, you could select multitude of attributes. You could select from IP subnet. And this is primarily useful if you're trying to restrict, let's say, your contractors to be able to access your documents only when they're in their office. You could also set a device policy and say, I want you to have password on, encryption on, patched version. It should be a company-owned device, or it should be a device that I, as an admin, has approved. Um, and finally, you can select access allowed or denied based on geolocation. So I set an access level that it's only allowed from Germany. Now I apply that access level to my analyst group. And for drive and docs, I select the access level that I just created.
Now, notice I have not applied any restrictions on Gmail. So if Dan, who is a member of the analyst group, is going to try to access, he should be allowed access to Gmail. This is how you configure your end user message. Um, so you can give access to your intranet site or your access to your admin emails. Um, and when Dan tries to access from US his Gmail, he's allowed access because I've applied no rules to the Gmail. Uh, but when he tries to use Drive from same uh, device in US, he gets denied access. And he sees the message that you as an admin has configured. So as you can see, it's fairly easy to get started with context-aware access. Just pick an application, pick a set of users, and see how it works. Um, and then you can scale it to the rest of the organization. And finally, G Suite comes with Security Center that helps you protect, detect, and remediate any security incident. So security help is a place where you can actually see where, where you should be and where your organization really is. And you can set proactive rules to protect against phishing and other things. You can use the dashboards to actually look which users are at most risk for, say, phishing attacks. And if an incident actually happens, security investigation tool gives you all the tools to go and query what exactly happened, how it happened, and to remediate the, that for the future. With that, I'm going to hand it over to Ravi, who's going to talk about user and IT simplicity that we can enable with Cloud Identity. Hello, everyone. My name is Ravi Kumar. I'm a product manager focusing on cloud identity. And in this section, uh, we're going to focus on um, some of the key capabilities within cloud identity. As we've learned, cloud identity provides a simple and unified interface for admins to manage users, applications, and uh, devices. So we're zooming in on one of these aspects, uh, and then we'll be learning more in each of those areas. And we'll start with uh, first user management. So using cloud identity, you'll be able to provision cloud identity users or G Suite users using the admin console, using the APIs, or if you already have these user accounts in one of your corporate LDAP directories, you can simply install the Google Cloud Directory Sync, and you can automatically synchronize those user IDs and uh, also uh, uh, groups into uh, Cloud Identity. But you can also set automated uh, outbound user provisioning. For example, when um, you have, uh, you know, when you create, modify, or delete user accounts within Google, we can automatically make those changes for you in the downstream SaaS-based applications so that you are, your admins don't have to go to each of those SaaS-based applications and maintain those users. We do that automatically. So that saves a lot of time for admins. Now, the second aspect is the application management. Cloud Identity provides a rich catalog of pre-integrated applications. Uh, there are thousands of them. So these applications, they support single uh, sign-on standards like uh, SAML, OpenID, Connect. And we also recognize many companies have uh, uh, these legacy web-based applications where they don't support any of these standards, right? And for those applications, we're happy to announce that we have uh, something called password vaulted applications, which allows you to give your users this single sign-on-like experience for all those legacy web-based applications that rely on usernames and passwords, no standards-based um, single sign-on. Another recent launch is uh, group-based policies. It allows your administrators to uh, configure the policies based on the groups in addition to uh, OUs. So this will give you a greater flexibility to set all those policies and permissions while you can maintain your, uh, the OU structure in a simpler manner. The third aspect is uh, device management. So cloud identity allows you to manage uh, uh, a variety of uh, mobile devices, so starting with uh, 
Android devices, iOS devices, Chrome devices, ActiveSync, Jamboard, the smart boards. So using this, you'll be able to consistently set policies and enforce it across multiple endpoints on mobile devices. And with the recent launch of uh, fundamental desktop security, we are providing uh, an additional layer of security and also controls for your desktops. For example, when your user logs in uh, to any of uh, the Google services like Gmail or Drive or other services, so as soon as they log in, we automatically create a device entry for you. So now the admins can monitor all the devices, not only just the, the mobile devices, but also desktop devices that your users are using to access these, uh, your Google services. It could be company-owned devices, or it could be BYOD devices. Your user can log in using any browser and any device, for example, Windows, Mac, Linux. So regardless of what browser and what device they use, we automatically create these device entries for you. And also, in case if there is a, a loss of device or if, um, if there is a loss of device or if your user, uh, for example, logs into one of the kiosks, like an airport or library, and then they forget to log out of the device, they could easily go to the admins can easily go to the admin console, and then they, they can remote sign out uh, those um, user accounts from uh, the admin console. And this capability also works um, in cases of a shared computer. So if you have uh, multiple accounts on the same machine, it doesn't matter. You'll be able to go and uh, remote sign out a user. All right. So now let's focus a little bit on the on-premise based applications and uh, legacy applications. And we all know SaaS-based adoption is going through the roof, regardless of whether it's a small, medium, or large company, right? But from, um, if you look at the majority of uh, the medium size and larger businesses, you still have a good chunk of your infrastructure and also on, uh, and applications uh, still on-premise. And in many cases, in order to maintain this, your admins are forced to use uh, two different identity systems. One identity system to support your on-premise applications and infrastructure, and another identity system to support those modern cloud-based applications. Right? The problem with this approach is now your directory is fragmented, and there your security policies are fragmented. You need to maintain your security policies and access controls in two different systems. And often, it creates a lot of complexity and also increases the total cost of ownership. So with the, the cloud identity hybrid approach, what we do is we want to meet you where you are. So we want to integrate with uh, your cloud-based solutions and also on-premise based applications, which allows you to reduce, again, the uh, total cost of ownership and also reduce complexity. And uh, the best part is it allows you to move some or all of these in, case, in future to cloud. For example, if you're lifting and shifting your applications, you don't have to lift a finger. So these applications will automatically work from an identity perspective. You don't have to reconfigure this when you lift and shift. That saves a lot of time when you go to, when you lift and shift your applications into cloud. Now, let's look at uh, a feature called Secure LDAP, which is part of uh, the cloud identity uh, hybrid approach. It's an LDAP as a service. So imagine having uh, an LDAP directory in cloud. With the only exception is you don't have to set it up. You don't have to manage it. You don't have to patch it. It's there for you because it's a SaaS-based service. What it does is it takes your existing Google directory, whether it's G Suite or cloud identity, and it makes it look like an LDAP directory for all your applications, LDAP-based applications, whether it's uh, on-premise, whether you have these applications and services in the cloud in an IaaS uh, platform, doesn't matter. And what it does is it also allows you to, allows these applications to do uh, LDAP operations like authenticating your users, authorization, group lookups, user lookups. And the best part is uh, there's no user change management involved because uh, 
whatever the changes that you need to make, your admin need to just go into these applications, go to the directory settings, and simply point to secure LDAP instead of a, a local directory. So it's a backend change. And these are some of the uh, secure LDAP partners who have certified their applications with um, secure LDAP. And also, if you have any other LDAP-based applications, don't worry. So secure LDAP works uh, with uh, any LDAP v3 compliant uh, application or service. OK, now let's see a little bit deeper into how you can configure secure LDAP. So this is a, a, an overly simplified diagram of how your application infrastructure might look. So you have uh, your internal LDAP-based applications or third-party LDAP applications shown at the bottom. And then you have your IT infrastructure, uh, like VPN servers or radio servers, network-attached uh, storage servers on the right side, and then also your desktops. So traditionally, you point all these applications and services to your local directory. And using secure LDAP, so your admins can go into the directory settings of each of those applications and then point those applications to uh, the LDAP server in the cloud. And then you simply upload the digital certificate that we provide to encrypt the LDAP uh, transactions between your on-premise or um, on-premise and uh, SaaS solution. And this is uh, another scenario where you might have uh, these lift and shift applications in the virtual machines on uh, an infrastructure as a service platform. So it could be GCP, Azure, AWS, doesn't matter. So again, so you uh, generally create virtual machines to uh, host your legacy corporate directories generally, and then uh, it's not just a single server, right? So you might need a couple of servers to support these applications. You want disaster recovery, so you double up the servers. And then if you have uh, users in multiple regions, you copy and paste in each of those regions, right? So the problem is you're taking the complexity that you currently have with your corporate directories on-premise, and then you're just like, replicating this on the cloud, which is not a great thing. So using a secure LDAP, again, so you can just simply point those into secure LDAP service. And if you have any Windows workloads, like uh, Windows servers or SharePoint and other Microsoft solutions that requires Kerberos, you could use uh, the managed AD uh, service called Cloud AD within GCP. All right, to summarize, so secure LDAP allows you to use cloud identity to authenticate user, your users, both for cloud-based applications and also on-premise-based applications. It helps you reduce dependence on the legacy directories and also reduces the complexity and uh, total cost of ownership. And the best part is you'll get the Google-grade reliability and also uh, scale and performance with uh, secure LDAP. All right, so let's, do a quick, let's see a quick demo on how you can configure secure LDAP. I'm switching the uh, screen to my laptop here. You can access uh, secure LDAP from um, the menu applications and LDAP. Here's the list of LDAP applications I've already configured. So here I'm onboarding a new LDAP application called, say, Papercut. It's an enterprise print management solution. I'm clicking on Continue. And in the second section, I'm uh, setting access permissions on how much you want to expose your directory to this particular application. So I can decide how much to expose for authentication-based uh, LDAP transactions. I can select the entire directory or a subset of uh, the directory. Since this application is being used by my entire organization, I might uh, enable entire domain. And you can also separately set access permissions on uh, how much you want to expose your directory for user read operations from LDAP directory and also expose um, the groups um, if it is doing authent authorization. Now I'm clicking on Add LDAP Client here. 
In a few seconds, we are onboarding this application, and also we are generating a digital certificate that you can use to onboard this application, to uh, configure this application, and encrypt uh, the LDAP operations. So now I download the certificate. And uh, I'm also going into PaperCut. So part two of Secure LDAP is you need to go to individual application and then point to Secure LDAP, the Secure LDAP directory, right? So this is the PaperCut admin console. So I'm going to the directory settings. I'm selecting Google Cloud Directory. If you don't see this option, don't worry. Just pick um, Open LDAP or another, any other generic LDAP option that you might see in the application. I've typed in my domain name. And uh, to save time, I've already uploaded the digital certificate. And then let's see. So when I click here, now what it's doing is it's authenticating itself to uh, secure LDAP using the digital certificate. And it was able to read some of these users and groups to fill out those cache. From an end user perspective, when someone walks up to their uh, printer, so they can simply type in their Google credentials to uh, release uh, their print job. So when they type in their Google credentials, PaperCut is going to take those credentials and then authenticate the user and authorize the user before letting them uh, go and uh, print those. Uh, 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 print their print jobs. OK, so as you can see, it's a, a very simple two-step process to onboard any application into cloud identity and then also generate certificate. And then you'll spend probably another like 10 or 15 minutes going into each of those applications and point to uh, secure LDAP to do establish that connection. All right, so now let's go back to uh, the slides, please. OK, so I'd like to invite my wonderful co-presenter, Mr. Simon, to uh, share his experiences on um, using uh, cloud identity and G Suite and Morrison's. Right. Thank you. Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, my name is Simon Langley. I'm the Chief Information Security Officer at Morrison's, and I'm going to try to navigate around here without falling off. Um, if you saw the photograph of me and think I must have had a particularly troubling journey in because I look 10 years older than the photograph. It's actually because it's a very old photograph. So I really am 10 years older than it looked. So I'm the Chief Information Security Officer, and it's probably pretty obvious what I do from that. Um, but one other aspect of what I do is I'm responsible for G Suite within Morrison's. So I was involved when we started to implement G Suite. And I've always been really interested in some of the new security capabilities that that's given us. So I've become more and more involved. And really, because of that, I now have a responsibility for G Suite itself as well. So for those of you from the UK, you're probably familiar with Morrison's. Uh, if you're not, you may not be. We are the fourth largest supermarket, the fourth largest of the four big four supermarkets in the UK. So we're based in Yorkshire, which is where I'm based. And it's something we're very proud of as a business. Um, we have 494 stores across the UK and about 350 filling stations. Now, um, we have about 110,000 employees, 90,000 of which are our frontline employees. So the people who work either in our stores or in our manufacturing facilities or in our distribution facilities. Um, that is a lot of people who previously had no sort of systems access at all. Uh, and G Suite is, is, has completely changed that for us. Um, we serve 11 million customers each week. And that's a mixture of online and face-to-face. We were relatively late to online delivery. So I think all of our competitors had some sort of offering before we did. Uh, that did bring some advantages, actually, because it meant that some of the old-fashioned technologies of sending a fax to a store and sending somebody around with a twat trolley, well, we did skip that. Um, one thing it did do, though, was it had a huge impact on our security approach. Because previously, we'd had a couple of 100,000 customer records. But now we've got about 12 or 13 million customer records. And that's really completely changed our security posture. So data loss prevention is a really important thing for Morrison's. And uh, G Suite, was, it was quite a challenge to start off with, certainly in terms of selling that internally. Would this prove to be a big problem for us? 
So our first foray into using Google was to use G Suite. So we now use quite a few Google tools. We use BigQuery, we use GCP, and so on. Um, and I'm going to come on to Cloud Identity in a minute. But to start off with, it was G Suite. And we, we did this for various reasons. And some of them have already been referred to, actually. So initially, to improve collaboration and mobility across the organization. Um, our previously, we were using uh, Microsoft Office. And that worked fine for individual users, as long as they were actually in the building or VPN in. Um, that was a real issue, though. Very few staff had any way of accessing information on their phone. Very few of them could access their email on the phone. And that was fine 10 years ago. It's clearly not fine now. Um, that just wouldn't work in today's business environment. Um, one thing that was a big thing as well, for, certainly from my perspective, was collaboration. So G Suite has brought some really useful collaboration tools, such as Hangouts. One thing I particularly like is everybody being able to work on the same document at the same time. So we will work in these slides together. Um, you can edit, have you know, 10 people all editing a document at the same time. Uh, I used to use Lotus Notes back in the day, and you had to check things in, check them out, and you'd find that somebody had made a change at the same time as you'd made it. Uh, you'd have the same thing if you were trying to send copies of Office documents around. Uh, you've edited version 1.3, and Kevin's changed version 1.4, and it was a real pain for us. Uh, that doesn't happen anymore. We have a single current version of a document, and you can have lots of people working at the same time. And because Google syncs every single keystroke, um, you don't have synchronization issues with that, and that's been really important to us. Uh, we also had issues trying to find the information in the organization, and one of the things that Google is famous for is search. It is now much, much easier to find documents that are on Drive. Uh, occasionally, we find documents that people inadvertently shared more broadly than they should. Uh, we do have ways of controlling that, but generally speaking, it is now much easier for us to find information uh, that's stored on Drive. And it gives me, as a CISO, greater access and visibility into the way people are using the tools. But the really big thing for us was uh, frontline workers and be able to communicate with them. Previously, it was all done by a poster in a store or a briefing. Uh, now it's genuine two-way communication. So we use G Plus for uh, communities. We have a fruit and veg community. And a, I don't know exactly what people do on a fruit and veg community, post pictures of funny tomatoes or something. But uh, it has gone down very well with our staff, and it's really increased our colleague engagement. Now, as part of that, one of the tools that we implemented, in fact, I first heard about it here last year, was Cloud Identity. And it was a really interesting presentation because it immediately ticked a few boxes for some of the things that we wanted to do. So a couple of the ways, I'll give a couple of examples of the way we use Cloud Identity. We've been using it since it's been in, in beta, uh, and now it's just gone into GA. Um, one of them is we have a, what's called a supplier portal. So we have a, we're a big business. We have a huge number of suppliers. And managing those suppliers and managing the information, managing things like the orders that we take in from them, purchase orders, and so on, was pretty challenging before and was all done by our staff. We now have a supplier portal, and we use a, a, a bare cloud identity for people to authenticate. So all of our suppliers can now authenticate. Uh, we're also rolling out two-stage verification to all of those identities. And once we've done that, where we have done it, for instance, we're allowing people to amend their own standing data, things like bank details, which clearly we couldn't have done before. Um, so, uh, so I talked a bit about our frontline workers before. Now, our CEO uh, actually started work sacking shelves in a Tesco. He knows what it's like to be a frontline worker, and he knows what it's like to feel disengaged from the business. So that's been a really important thing for us. And I, I talked a bit about the collaboration and access to technology before. Um, one of the things also is the greater visibility that, that I get as a CISO and my team gets in the way in which people use Google. So when people are using offline tools like Office, uh, I don't see that any of that. We had a huge amount of information, for instance, stored on PCs that was accessible to that single person. If somebody left and their machine was wiped, that was it. The information was gone. And that used to happen on a surprisingly regular basis. So that's something that we've managed to, to uh, pretty much eliminate. That's been really important. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about um, the way in which we use uh, context-aware access. 
because that's been uh, really useful to us. Um, I did. I mentioned we, that one of the ways in which we're using context-aware access. One other one is our accounts payable function is outsourced to uh, an Indian company, and uh, that relationship works pretty well. But it was important that we be able to communicate effectively with them. So we wanted to give all of them a Google identity as well. Now the third party was a bit nervous about the implications of allowing people to log in from any location. Now for us, that's generally a great thing, but the third party was pretty nervous about that. So one of the things that context-aware access has allowed us to do is very similar to the demonstration, is to tie down access so they have to be in their office to log in. Now it might slightly defeat the, the benefits of mobility in some ways, but this was a choice they made. It wasn't one we imposed on them, but it was really important. Now, I'm curious now, how many people have read uh, the Beyond Court paper, Betsy Bear's paper? A um, few of you. I, mean, I, I really recommend it to you. It's really made a big difference to me in my, the way I look at, at security. So the, the basic idea is that you don't trust the network. You don't just assume that you know who somebody is because they're on the network. My background is as a, a security consultant. I used to work for PricewaterhouseCoopers uh, until about five years ago. And one of the things I used to see is that perimeter security is often quite strong in a lot of organizations. I think it's quite strong at ours. Once you're on the network, though, you can pretty much do what you like a lot of the time. I used to run pen testing teams. And they usually found that no matter how good the external controls were, once you're on the network, that would, you'd pretty much won at that point. So trusting the network is a fool's game. What we now try to do, and this is very much the approach that's outlined in the Beyond Court paper, is to expose applications to the internet. Usually that's because they're cloud applications, but it doesn't have to be. They could just have a, a, a web front end to an existing application. Uh, but to make sure that all the accesses are really strongly authenticated. So you can do that using two-factor authentication, obviously, if it's a, an individual. It can be done with certificates if you're talking about services. But that's a, a big step forward in that we, as long as we know that somebody's been strongly authenticated, we don't have to trust the network, uh, which is a great relief to me. Now, Unfortunately, we can't do that everywhere. So secure LDAP that um, Ravi mentioned before does give us a way to integrate some of our legacy applications uh, that are running on LDAP into our, our Google identity. And we're trying that with various, uh, various applications that we still have on premise. Now, I talked about multi-factor authentication. This is, this is a really important control to me. This is probably, if I had to pick one thing, this is the thing that's made a massive difference to me. Uh, you're probably all aware of the risks of credential stuffing attacks, and um, that's become the big thing uh, uh, across our sector and certainly across most sectors. A lot of customers, no matter how hard we try to persuade them, will just choose different part the same password for every single application they use, every single website they visit. Um, we do have some ways of stopping our staff from doing that, but the best way to do that is with two-stage verification. So for most of our staff, that's done using uh, either SMS, which I'm not personally a big fan of, or using the prompt on phones. But um, all of our super admins, the Google super admins, use it. So I've got a hardware key that I occasionally have to tell people not to leave plugged into their machines. But um, I auth uh, authenticate to my Google account using this. And I can be almost certain that if somebody's logged in as me, that was me. And that's really useful both from a security perspective, but also from a forensic perspective as well. There's none of this, oh, well, I sh shared my password with somebody which is an astonishing excuse for somebody to use, but I, I've heard that more than once. So using multi-factor authentication is really useful, um, and using uh, contact-aware access is, is very helpful in terms of ensuring we can say that if you're logging in from this place, you don't need to use a hardware key. If you're logging in from here, you, you do. But another big benefit, and this is where um, the cloud identity has been a real enabler for us, is single sign-on. So we use the Google identity to sign on to as many applications as we can. And because we have our Google identities tied into our HR system, that means that when somebody leaves and their, their access is terminated automatically, my team doesn't have to do anything at all. All the access that they previously had that was mediated by Google all goes in one fell swoop. That's been really useful. And particularly as we've rolled access out to our frontline workers, they could all access their own HR records now. So they can access their own HR records. You know, we use Oracle Cloud HCM. Anywhere they are, using their own device. And that, again, has been really helpful in improving the level of engagement with our colleagues. So this is something that we are going to try and do more and more. And every new application we roll out it will be a cloud application. And one of the first questions I always ask is, can we authenticate using Google? And if they say no, we tend to look elsewhere. 
So at the moment, we're just migrating from PeopleSoft to Oracle. But uh, we're about to implement ServiceNow, and we use GCP. So we're, we're using a very wide range of services. And, and it's worked really well for us. Now, the last area I want to talk about is uh, mobile device management. We, when I first started at Morrison's five years ago, we used three separate MDM tools, none of which we liked. Uh, that's why we had three of them, because we hoped that if we had three of them, at least between them, they'd be able to do all the stuff we wanted, uh, which they didn't really. So now we largely rely on Google MDM. We still do have one tool that we haven't quite managed to migrate off. Uh, but one of the things that was referred to earlier on in the presentation is desktop management. So most of our uh, laptops are Windows PCs, but we do have quite a few people who use Macs, and some of these are corporate Macs. I now have a way of imposing controls on them that I just previously didn't have. So that's been really helpful for us. So Google has become fairly device agnostic. It'll work on an iPad, it'll work on an iPhone, it'll work on a Windows PC. A lot of our developers use Linux. It'll work across those platforms. And it gives me a single way of controlling all of those that we previously didn't have until we started, we rolled out Google. And as far as the impact on users, we've got a slightly curious uh, group of users. Typically, they have been quite suspicious of people in the center. So if we were to say to people, can we just install this agent on your mobile phone? The answer would have been an absolute no. Uh, people were pretty paranoid about what we were going to do. They were worried that we'd wipe the device. They were worried that we'd have access to information they didn't want us to see. Um, now, all they have to do is install a device policy, and they can use the full range of G Suite tools. And all that does is, uh, with the way we've configured it, is to make them use a pin. It's slightly surprising that people didn't all do that already, but they didn't, um, and to encrypt the devices. So we're quite light touch about it. But um, as we've rolled on, the level of resistance we face has been pretty minimal over the last, the last couple of years. So now we have a way of we can wipe a device. So if, if somebody le leaves, their account's wiped automatically. If there is some sort of an investigation, we can wipe a device. Uh, we, but we can still see all the information. And that's been really helpful to us. So, We've moved from largely to use a single tool to manage all the devices, largely a single way of managing all our users, and an effective way of authenticating them all right across the estate. Uh, and that's been something that, as a CISO, has been really valuable to me, but it also really helped to increase the level of engagement with our colleagues, and has been very much a positive thing. Um, there have been a few things that have been minor challenges, I mean, as, as there are whenever you, you know, move from one thing to another. People all say, well, I'm familiar with Outlook. I don't really know how to use G Gmail. Mostly, that has been very, very straightforward. I'll just give one example. I was talking to uh, one of our PAs in the legal department uh, after we rolled out Gmail. And I asked her what she thought of it. And she said she thought she hated it, uh, which I was a bit disappointed to hear. Um, and I asked her why. And she said, well, this is good. I used to use folders in Outlook. And now there aren't any folders. And I can't do that. And I don't know how to find anything. So all I did was show how to use labels in Gmail and teach some of the search operators. And it took me about five or 10 minutes to do. Next time I asked her, three days later, I said, what do you think? And she said, I think it's brilliant. So it's worth thinking that, well, I know there is another session on the importance of continuing support after the initial rollout. But I do, if you are doing that, make sure you do have that support in place. Because it is the difference between people kicking and screaming and people saying, this is great. It's really changed the way I work, uh, which is what I would like people to do. So uh, thank you very much for, for listening. Um, I hope that's been useful. And uh, enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you very much.